Plutarch Heavensby is a fascinating character in the Hunger Games series because his allegiance is constantly questioned by both the audience and Katniss herself. He is a master of propaganda, which I'll highlight in this video. With the unfortunate passing of Philip Seymour Hoffman, the man that played the character in the Hunger Games films, his story was sort of incomplete as they had to write him out of the final film quite a bit, and they also gave many of his moments to other characters. So today, I'm going to break his character down and go over his entire life from the novels. And notice I said novels, not films. There are many differences when looking at the two. This video is based on the books. On top of that, we'll go over some deeper meanings with this character arc and writing structure to really understand who Plutarch is as a person and why he did what he did. Before we start, make sure you hit that like button. It will greatly help the channel with the algorithm, meaning more people will see my content. So if you have a second, I would really appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you see, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified about new uploads. My reach also stretches well beyond just this channel. I'm on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram where I do similar things that I do here on this channel. The links for all of my social media as well as my Patreon are in the description. If you want, give me a follow. If not, that's totally fine. Now, let's get the video started. Plutarch was born and raised in the capital, meaning he was pampered and brought up very luxuriously. He was surrounded by people in the capital who felt they were better than those in the districts, and unlike most in the capital who embraced this, Plutarch was rare and sort of shied away from this instead. However, that did not stop him from pursuing a very impressive career in the Hunger Games. He worked his way up and eventually proved himself to be worthy of becoming a game maker. He worked alongside the head game makers, getting them whatever they needed and abiding by their rules, and he did this for a number of years. However, during those years, he had also been involved in an underground group that was aiming to overthrow the capital, but he of course kept this under wraps. When it came time for the 74th Hunger Games, he was working for the head game maker that year named Seneca Crane. Plutarch was present for all of the tribute's private sessions to show off their skills, and one person stuck out to him more than any other, and that was Katniss Everdeen, the female tribute from District 12. Katniss earned this attention when Plutarch and the other game makers turned away after she missed her first shot, not giving her another chance. They were then in for a huge shock when she shot an arrow up toward them and pinned an apple to the wall. This startled Plutarch so much that he fell backward into a punch bowl, knocking it to the floor. During Katniss's interview, Caesar Flickerman asked Katniss for details about a private training session, but Plutarch jumped in saying that she could not reveal any details. That year's games did not go according to plan for the game makers, as the same girl that started all the trouble outside the arena also caused a whole lot of trouble inside the arena as well, making the capital look weak and foolish with their Barry stunt. Stop! Stop! Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the winners of the 74th Annual Hunger Games. This eventually led to Plutarch's boss, Seneca Crane's execution, and this opened the door for Plutarch to become the next head game maker. Though it was clear there were not many takers for the job, so he did not have much competition. Plutarch, of course, had ulterior motives when taking on this job, as he did not view the Capitol or the Hunger Games the way most Capitol citizens did. He knew there needed to be a change, and he decided he would take a lead role to ensure that happened. This of course put him in a very dangerous position though. Going against the capital was a death sentence if they found out, but he didn't care, which really showed Plutarch's bravery. Plutarch attended the 74th Hunger Games Victory Tour celebration that took place at President Snow's mansion. While there, he approached Katniss and Peeta, introduced himself, and said that he was the head game maker. He asked Peeta if he could steal Katniss for a dance, and Peeta obliged. While dancing with Katniss, Plutarch joked about his responsibilities as game maker, and Katniss laughed along, though deep down, she was disgusted by him. Plutarch mentioned to Katniss that he had to go to a strategy meeting for the upcoming games, something that was usually kept under wraps, but he told Katniss that he was sure she could keep his secret. Katniss assured him that she could, and as Plutarch said goodbye, he ensured that Katniss saw his wristwatch, which bore a Mockingjay on its face. Plutarch said it was one of a kind, then walked away. Looking deeper at this scene, this whole conversation was a careful way of trying to win Katniss's trust. Showing her the Mockingjay and saying it was one of a kind was his way of hinting toward the rebellion and how Katniss was the Mockingjay who was also one of a kind, basically saying that she was the key to overthrowing the capital. Katniss, however, did not pick up on this and just thought it was a weird capital trend. 
Katniss wasn't quite sure what to make of Plutarch after this, as he seemed to be just another in a long line of sadistic game makers. But at the same time, he was oddly friendly and even flirty with Katniss. Looking deeper at Katniss's understanding of this conversation, she knew that the sign of the rebellion was a mockingjay, so she pondered why the head game maker would wear such a thing that bore that sign. For the time being, Katniss interpreted the watch as proof that Plutarch was superficial and jealous just like the other residents of the capital. But for us readers, this was Suzanne Collins' subtle way of giving us a hint about her twist ending at the end of the book, that Plutarch is actually a rebel. Plutarch began to plant the seeds of the rebellion's plans, and he encouraged President Snow to pick from the existing pool of victors for the third quarter quell. This not only pushed the plans of the rebellion forward, but at the same time, it brilliantly made President Snow, the very man Plutarch was going against, gain more trust in him. When the tributes arrived, Plutarch smartly kept his cover low, showing no thought of Katniss in public, treating her just like all the other tributes, even though he had put everything into her. Without her, he was dead, either by the hand of the Capitol, or by the Rebellion, who could think he sabotaged their plans. As he watched the tributes develop their skills below, Katniss alongside Wyrus and Beatty looked up at him, and Wyrus pointed out that there was a force field between him and the tributes, something that Katniss realized was put into place after her arrow to the apple stunt. Little did Katniss know, Beatty and Wyrus, the District 3 tributes, were working with Plutarch, and on top of District 3 being in on it, as were Districts 4, 6, 7, 8, and 11, all of them working with Plutarch, and all of whom were ready to help protect Katniss in the arena, which is exactly what they they did. When it came time for the private sessions of the tributes, Plutarch was quite shocked when both Peta and Katniss did something to defy the capital, especially Katniss, as she tied a dummy up, portraying Plutarch's dead predecessor. However, deep down, he loved the fire in Katniss, knowing that she was the spark they needed to make the rebellion work. If anything, this display only made Plutarch more confident in his master plan. During the games, we saw the Morphling jump in front of Peta to save his life, and gave her own life in the process, and this was sort of Plutarch's doing, as he had made it clear to all the tributes working with him to keep not only Katniss safe, but Peta as well, because he knew that if Peta died, they would lose Katniss's alliance. During the games, Katniss realized that the arena was a clock, and something clicked in her brain just as Plutarch had hoped it would, as she deduced that Plutarch's Mockingjay watch was actually a hint about how the arena would work, and Plutarch was actually helping her. This is also yet another example of Collins pointing to the twist ending with Plutarch's character arc, giving the reader little hints here and there. It makes us question if he's actually loyal to the capital as we originally thought. During the games, Plutarch sent Beatty bread, which was Plutarch's way of symbolizing the day and hour when they should begin their escape. When the arena blew up, which Plutarch and the rebels had planned, though it happened a little differently than they expected, they took their chance, and Plutarch personally flew down a hovercraft and took Katniss along with Finnick and Beatty out of the arena. When Katniss made it up, Plutarch gently closed her eyes before she went to sleep. They hooked Katniss and Beatty up to machines so they could recover, and Plutarch discussed strategy with Hamish and Finnick, both of whom he had been working with this whole time. Katniss then burst in, and Plutarch kindly told her to sit down and drink a bowl of broth, which he set in front of her. This act of kindness is key, and one that Collins purposefully pointed out. Throughout the book, Plutarch had been the embodiment of the Hunger Games' cruelty and sadism. Thus, it was only appropriate that the sudden revelations about the Hunger Games begin with a sudden revelation about Plutarch himself. He's a kind man after all. They all filled Katniss in on the plan, Hamish saying that Plutarch had been working against the capital for years now. They then told Katniss that they were on their way to District 13, and they said that most districts were in a state of rebellion. Plutarch then told Katniss that she had to be saved, because she was the symbol for the rebels across Pan Am. You have been our mission from the beginning. The plan was always to get you out. Half the tributes were in on it. This is the revolution, and you are the Mockingjay. However, things got out of hand when Katniss was told Peta was captured by the Capitol, and when she violently went after Haymitch, she was forcibly sedated. After arriving in District 13, Plutarch immediately began to work with their president, Alma Coin, along with a few others, to plan their next move. They began to script and plan out what they would have Katniss do as the face of the rebellion. 
After a few weeks there, Katniss said she wanted to visit the ruins of District 12, which had been bombed, and Plutarch agreed and accompanied her alongside Gale, President Coyne, and a few others. A little while after getting back from 12, a broadcast of PETA being interviewed by Caesar Flickerman aired, and Plutarch along with Coyne called Katniss to command to see this. This paid off, as seeing this incited Katniss to agree to be the Mockingjay. However, she had some demands for Plutarch and Coyne in order to make this happen. Plutarch was nervous to allow Gale and Katniss to hunt above ground, but Coyne overruled him and allowed it. Coyne then asked Katniss if she would like to make Gale her new lover, but Plutarch stepped in this time, saying they should continue the romance between Katniss and Peeta and pretend that Gale was Katniss's cousin. This was a brilliant move on his part, because this was the exact tactic the Capitol reporters had used with Gale when Katniss and Peeta were pretending to be in love with one another. Plutarch was using the Capitol's own tactics to shift the narrative in the rebellion's favor against the Capitol. This is also an early sign of how skilled Plutarch would become with propaganda. Now that Katniss was officially on board for the rebellion, Plutarch showed Katniss in a sketchbook with all sorts of designs he made, and he told her that they were making a number of propaganda videos, which they had been scripting for weeks. Plutarch then took Katniss and Gale down to door 3908, and Plutarch was surprised to find a guard at the door. After Katniss and Gale forcibly made their way into the room, they found Katniss's prep team locked up, naked, and bruised. Plutarch was very confused by this, and the guard told him that they were locked up for stealing food. Plutarch ordered the guard to release them, saying he would take full responsibility from Coin, and the guard obliged. When Plutarch arrived at the hospital a little while later, Katniss pointed out that Coin was sending them a message, comply with the rules of District 13 or face the consequences. Plutarch, however, said that they were too important to the rebel cause to be punished in such a way, but Katniss pointed out that leaders, like Hunger Game contestants, are important until they're not. When it came time to film the propaganda videos, it was a disaster. Whenever you're ready. People of Pan Am, we fight, we dare to end this hunger for justice! When Hamish voiced that they should put Katniss in the field to get a good performance out of her, Plutarch agreed immediately. Before deploying, Plutarch also came up with the idea of telling the public that Katniss lost her and Peeta's baby in a miscarriage, which was a stroke of brilliance. This is yet another sign of how skilled Plutarch is when it comes to propaganda. He knows what will resonate with people, using these lies to manipulate the narrative. While briefing Katniss to go out into the action, Gale asked what kind of government the rebels would install to replace the current one, and Plutarch replied saying that there would be a system of representative democracy in which each district would have a leader who participated in a centralized government, and Katniss said she liked this idea. Plutarch wished Katniss good luck on her mission, and before returning to the rebel stronghold, he pointed out a small pocket on Katniss's shoulder. He told her it housed Nightlock, a powerful poison that he instructed Katniss to take if she was apprehended by the capital. He notes that these pills have been dubbed Nightlock in honor of Katniss's threat to poison herself with Nightlock berries in her first Hunger Games. While out on her mission, an attack came, and Plutarch ordered Katniss to go to a safe location, but Katniss took the earpiece out and ran to help the hospital that was being bombed. Later on, Plutarch was actually okay with this, as they got some incredible footage for the propaganda video. Plutarch made the decision not to tell President Coyne that Katniss had disobeyed his orders, making her think that he gave Katniss the order to go help the hospital. This shows that Plutarch might have some reservations about Coyne, especially after the incident with Katniss's prep team. After Katniss had a breakdown, the cause of which was realizing that Snow was using PETA to blackmail her, Plutarch put together a crew to rescue PETA from the capital. The mission was a success, and they freed not only PETA, but Joanna and Annie as well. What they did not foresee, though, was PETA's brainwashing, which led to him almost choking Katniss to death. Plutarch worked very hard to try and reverse the brainwashing for Katniss, and at Prim's suggestion, they started to condition PETA to calm down when he saw Katniss, rather than get ramped up. Plutarch told Katniss that this had mixed success. It made Peeta extremely confused, but also mitigated his fear of her. When Katniss was shot in the field, she was brought back to the hospital in District 13, and Plutarch paid her a visit. While there, he mentioned the phrase bread and circuses in Latin, and explained its meaning, saying that governments have tried to control their people by giving them entertainment. This way, the people were too distracted to rebel, the very thing Pan Am had been doing for the past 75 years. Plutarch also gave Katniss the good news that Finnick and Annie were to be married soon, which cheered Katniss up quite a bit. 
On the day of the wedding, Plutarch privately told Cadmus that the wedding would be useful for propaganda footage. This has always been interesting to me, because this section of the novel contrasts the sincere pleasure of Finnick and Annie's marriage with the coldness and cynicism of propaganda. Plutarch can't help but praise the wedding on the grounds that it's good propaganda, even while it's an event of real joy for the couple. It shows that the rebel leaders, like those in the capital, are so used to thinking of things as media spectacles that they can't experience reality normally anymore. Plutarch was there to send Katniss, Finnick, Gale, and the rest of the team into the capital, and he debriefed them on what they would face, saying there would be a ton of booby traps that they could hit. He pulled out a holograph that showed the plans of this area, something he had stolen before leaving the capital, and he said it would help guide them through without getting blown up. At the end of this mission, bombs were dropped outside Snow's mansion, killing many, including many young children, and everybody thought this was Snow's doing. However, we later find out that President Coyne was the one behind this. When Snow was telling Katniss this, he pointed out that the bombing was aired live, which was surely the result of Plutarch's careful planning. Because looking deeper, we've learned that Plutarch excels at propaganda, and this was his biggest and greatest form of propaganda yet, swaying the allegiance of an entire country on one man who did not even commit the crime. After everything went down, Coyne showed her true colors even more, as she wanted to kill Effie Trinket. But Plutarch along with Hamish fought Coyne to keep her alive, and luckily they persuaded her. This shows that Plutarch did not go as far to the dark side as Coyne did. His dark deeds were finished after framing Snow for the bombing. After that, he wanted to move on. He did what he had to do, and that was it. At Snow's execution, Katniss killed Coin instead of Snow, taking down the great monster that she was. After Snow was killed as well, everything was up in the air, but Plutarch put all of his focus into helping Katniss. He was present at her trial, and he vouched for her, saying that she should not be punished, reasoning that she was a borderline insane warrior who had had enough punishment. A few days later, Plutarch along with Hamish picked Katniss up in a hovercraft, and when she entered, Plutarch smiled looking very happy. Plutarch explained that Katniss' trial was over, and he had successfully made sure that she could walk away freely. Plutarch then told Katniss that he was appointed the new government's head of communications, and he said that he would use his power to ensure that people forgave and forgot Katniss' crimes. Looking at this more deeply, Collins once again painted an example of how skilled Plutarch was at propaganda, and though his days of dark manipulation were over, he still used that skill in a good way, this time swaying the public's image of Katniss to set her free of her crimes. This also makes everything come full circle, as propaganda got Katniss into this mess, and it's propaganda that got her out as well. It's also worth mentioning that Plutarch was not a big supporter of Coin, and we saw this early on in District 13 with how shocked and appalled he was at what Coin had done to Katniss's prep team. He worked with her because he knew she was a means to an end, but he was glad that she was gone. Plutarch is an interesting character because the line of black and white is very blurred. He had a talent for propaganda, which we focused a whole lot on in this video. We see that he utilized this skill in both good and bad ways. He did not turn to the dark side like Coin, but he certainly stepped a toe in that dark puddle, especially with his involvement in the bombing. Overall though, he's a good guy, which really shines through in most of his character arc. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.